city, also known as the Big Apple, or the center of the world. Nine million people live here, and 40 million tourists visit each year. That's a lot of stomachs to feed, but there's no shortage of food here. It's everywhere, on almost every street corner, usually served by men and women who started their lives in another country and came here in search of a better standard of living and to make money. The simplest, quickest, and most popular snack is as synonymous with New York as the skyscrapers and yellow cabs. No tourist visit is complete without buying a hot dog at one of the many vendors started around Manhattan. But what few visitors realize is that for street vendors here, they face a daily struggle just to survive in business. We have a big enemy. These are vendor tickets, and this has got to stop. I did the hunger strike. Tough out there. That's street food from New York. It's 9 in the morning in midtown Manhattan, and there's lots of polishing and cleaning going on. In this garage, street food vendors have already been at work for a couple of hours, restocking their carts and making sure that the stainless steel will gleam in the sunlight. I freeze the water. The facility is run by Mohammed El Sayed, who moved to the States from Egypt and has been in the vending business for 21 years. It's provided him with a good living. But Mohammed says it's a grueling job. We are in the street. We're taking all the cold, the rain, and the hot, the heat. So we take everything. It's a tough job. This is one of the most tough jobs in New York City. He runs six of his own carts and leases space to more than 20, operated by vendors from mainly the Middle East. Ali Baladi left Tehran for political reasons nearly half a century ago and has been selling hot dogs ever since. He's made enough money to enable his children to attend top universities here. I have a very, very, very beautiful family. My son, one is Finnish Columbia, one is Finnish Cornell, one pharmacy. Some of the carts are heading for bustling tourist areas. while others service the needs of the business community. This is a crowded, fast-paced, high-stress environment. 60,000 people per square mile. Office workers are looking for a quick and inexpensive meal that often they will take back to their desk to eat while working. Ala from Cairo is a rookie vendor who came to the U.S. just eight months ago. He'd like to study here, but right now needs the cash from selling hot dogs to survive in what is one of the world's most expensive cities. I hope to, uh, to learn in the uh, schools, the faculty, but too much money, and I have a lot of bills. Yeah, uh, it's just uh, easy uh, work. The man on the bike is the all-powerful, anonymous food critic for the popular Village Voice paper. Would you, would you give any vendors a, a five-star recommendation? Or do they have their own scale? No, um, street food can be just as good as the food in a five-star restaurant. It can even be better. So I'm thinking of like lamb shish kebabs that you get from Greek vendors in Astoria are just as good as anything you can get at the most expensive restaurant in town. Of course, it won't be on fancy china and it won't be with crystal or served with wine, but you know, the beauty of street food too is that you can bring alone your own bottle of wine and kind of illegally drink it in the, in the corner on the park or something. So. Why do conventional cafes and restaurants think of vendors? Do they see them as a threat? They, they probably don't like them. Arthur Schwartz is a food historian and says that at one time there used to be 25,000 street vendors in the city. 
Whatever the new immigrant group is in New York, that's the food that we get on the street. So there was a time, for instance, where you could buy oysters on the street. New York was a big oyster town in, in the early uh, 20th century, and there were carts. You could just, on the street, eat oysters and clams on the half shell. Nowadays, because we have a lot of people from Bangladesh and Pakistan and from uh, various Middle Eastern countries and Afghanistan, we have a whole new range of carts. There are four main types of push cart. The more elaborate ones can cost as much as $30,000. It's a cash-only business. And one recent survey suggested that most vendors don't earn a lot, between seven and $14,000 a year. However, the fortunate few can make a lot more. One prime location here, outside the Museum for Modern Art, was recently awarded to a vendor who agreed to pay a staggering $300,000 for three years. New vendors usually try to find a location that is a reasonable distance from other street food sellers. There is an unwritten brotherhood between them, but not always. Ali Bilotti has been involved in a turf war with a truck that arrived three months ago, operated by Jordanians. My problem 20 years here, now this truck is coming, it's close to my business. I now have a business, you know, it's sell everything. Police officers have refused to intervene in the dispute. And for now, Mr. Bilotti is unsure of what else he can do. Manhattan's predominantly Muslim street food vendors come to air their grievances and seek advice and support at the mosque. This is the largest one in the city and attended by people from more than 70 countries. Most of those who are on the street selling food are Muslims, either from Middle East or South Asia. Uh, we find Bangladeshis, Pakistani, Egyptians, uh, Palestinians. And so I was surprised to find many Muslims are really on the street selling food, and it's uh, amazing for me. The Muslims coming to this country basically for at least two reasons. Uh, they want better life, but you have to understand also that some Muslims also come into this country for political reasons. They want more freedom, they want democracy that they didn't find back home. The mosque is a great place for vendors to come in order to discuss some of the problems and issues that they face. But sometimes you've got to step outside of your community in order to battle in the sea of regulation. In Manhattan, the biggest daily challenge for the city's 3,000 licensed street food vendors is observing the strict laws about the way they must operate, many of which seem arbitrary and open to interpretation. City officials legislate on health and safety and ensure that the cart itself adheres to very specific requirements. The police ensure that carts are only positioned where they're allowed to be and check that the permits are displayed and up to date. Violations can bring tickets and fines stiff enough to put a vendor permanently out of business. For example, this one for uh, failing to display his license. He uh, was vending uh, hot dogs without uh, displaying his license. For nine months, Sean Bazinski sold Mexican burritos on Park Avenue to raise cash for law school. How are you doing? He soon realized that food vendors needed legal help and is now director of the street vendor program for the social action group Street Justice. Every day there is a team of, of police officers who are cruising the city uh, and their sole job is just to do vendor enforcement. Why? why? Why are they targeting vendors in particular? It's a function of the people who have power in our city. Uh, the big businesses and the big uh, real estate uh, companies in general don't like street vendors. They think that they want the streets to look the way that they want them to look. And so they're, uh, you know, they're constantly calling the police department and they're constantly going to community meetings and complaining. And, uh, you know, those are the folks that really have the power in our city and they have the ability to get things done. So as a result, uh, vendors, you know, get the short end of the stick. People like Tony Dragonis, seen here in the blue shirt, who took over this spot from his father 25 years ago and has loyal and longtime customers. Now he's in jeopardy of losing it all, as the city wants to revoke his license. But Sean is helping prepare his legal defense. 
Uh, some of his tickets are for $1,000 for things like uh, being nine feet away from the crosswalk instead of 10 feet. Or uh, even if you're a licensed vendor, but you forget to wear your license around your neck, uh, that could be a violation. Uh, he owes uh, $16,985, yeah, which is a lot of money, obviously, but especially a lot of money if you're a street vendor. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So are health officials sympathetic at all to the difficulties that vendors are facing? Well, it doesn't seem so. The word from City Hall is that the laws and codes are clear and are there to be obeyed. We do uh, routine inspections where we actually send inspectors out and we sweep the city. We go section by section. Uh, we also coordinate sweeps, interagency task force sweeps. My message would be to, um, number one, pay attention to the law. And if you're having problems understanding the law, please give us a call. And Mr. Middleton insists that his inspectors are not issuing tickets to meet any quota system. It's very possible to, to operate without getting a, a ticket. Mohammed has had his fair share of run-ins with authority here, too, and has attended court to support colleagues on numerous occasions. Do you know of anyone that's ever lost their business because they haven't been able to pay any of these fines? Yes, uh, two, three guys, but they gave them revoked like for two years to pay, and after that they go to collection agent and they pay little by little, but they got the license back after two years. When a former mayor tried to ban Mohammed from his favorite spot, he fought back. In 1994, when Mayor Giuliani, who was a mayor in New York City, he restricted some of the street, and one of the streets is mine. Well, I, we challenged, I did a, we did a hunger strike. I did a hunger strike in the street for three days. And even, I call him a lot of names, but, uh, well, we succeed after two and a half years. It's the end of a long, hot day for some street vendors, but others will also be starting to head out to tempt the late night crowds in the city that never sleeps. No one disputes that it's a tough daily life, often with little financial reward. It's not easy trying to keep in step with all those laws and regulations that govern everything, from the amount of smoke the cart produces to the temperature of your boiled frankfurters. This is really a tale of two cities, for what happens across the river in Brooklyn and Queens is very different from what happens here in Manhattan. Welcome to Brooklyn, or rather, a small part of it now known as Little Russia by the Sea. The Russians and East Europeans are now here in force and have transformed what was once a run-down neighborhood into a desirable place to live. Brooklyn is the quintessential city of immigrants. One in seven Americans can trace their family roots through its streets. Lots of areas of this borough are very much divided along nationality lines. Just 10 minutes up the road, and you're in a Pakistani neighborhood. Another 10 minutes, and it's predominantly Jewish, Williamsburg. Vendors face just the same strict enforcement as in Manhattan. But one of the biggest differences is that there's a lot of illegal vending going on here. Maria is from Ecuador. She sells delicious slices of mango in a busy but crime and drug ridden area of Brooklyn. Here, people are watchful and suspicious of outsiders, especially when they have cameras. When we tried to accompany Maria to pick up fresh supplies, we were quickly surrounded by four men and had to stop filming for a time. Yo, what's up, man? Hey, how you doing? Yo, 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 damn. Maria has a vending license, but like so many thousands of others, no cart permit. <laughs> I would like to open my own fruit stall, a proper stall, where I wouldn't have to work on the street. I could sell lots of fruit and employ other people. <laughs> the city only allocates 3,000 annual cart permits, but 12,000 people have food vending licenses and want to sell on the streets. 
so thousands feel compelled to discreetly break the law. Hello, Oscar. Hi, Michelle. Um, Welcome to our center. Thank you very much. Oscar Parentes works for an organization that represents both official and unofficial street vendors. My co-worker. He says it's no longer just a job for newly arrived immigrants with only limited English. A sharp fall in the number of local factory jobs has also forced many to try and seek a living from food. The street vendors, they, you know, they don't have choices. They like, if I don't go out to continue selling, I'm going to die. Oscar says his members don't want to feel alienated. We want to pay taxes. We want to work in, in more organized environment. We want to continue living in this country. We want to be part of, of New York City in a positive way and, and follow this um, United States dream. His group are pressing for 15,000 cart permits to be issued, but he realizes that they will meet stiff resistance. We have a, a big enemy here in New York City, which is the big corporation, big stores, the big markets. They create tremendous barriers against us. Well, they, they are very scared. They think New York City is going to be full of street vendors, which is not true. These uh, street vendors from Ecuador, for example, they sell in the, the food, Ecuadorian food, in this community because this community is predom predominant Ecuadorians or Mexicans or Guatemalans. They don't want to uh, move to downtown Manhattan to sell the, you know, uh, food. This is Astoria in Queens, where there's a new royal on the block. I am the king of Malafo. Faris is a larger-than-life Palestinian who very much bucks the trend. He once owned a restaurant here, which is the eventual dream for many street vendors. Oh, but Faris yeah. closed his because he simply loves life on the street. Another one with the other hand. All right. With this kid, I remember his mom, his mom when she was pregnant. I look at him, he's a grown up kid now. That's why we're talking about being in the neighborhood. Faris says it took him months of trial and experimentation to come up with the unique taste of his falafel. A falafel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Falafel. Remember we used to make the falafel? We put the falafel in the basket like this, fill it up, and sit and wait for the customers when they go and buy. Follow them actually to the middle of the block. Try the falafel, try the falafel. Wasn't easy. He's lucky there aren't any police around today. That's a major violation. His permit has washed away. In the city, if the permit is not, it doesn't show the numbers, they will remove the whole wagon away. They will take it. We have so many good food carts in New York now that the hot dog to me is the last resort. Uh, if there's only a hot dog around and I'm starving, actually what I'll get is nowadays they serve spicy, uh, sausage. It's really like a, a big hot dog. And that's actually tastes a lot better than these old hot dogs. But you know, we have these halal carts all over the place. There's a, a wonderful Korean cart on 52nd Street. You know, you don't go far for these carts, but uh, most neighborhoods have a selection of different items nowadays. So if you, let's say you're out, it's been a long day, you want a bite of street food, what do you go for? Oh, that's a good question. What's your top recommendation? Pizza. It's not really on the street food, but we have a pizzeria on every corner in New York. And uh, chances are you're going to get a better slice of pizza. And also, I can take a look at the pizza and know if it's going to be good. So I can walk out if it's not. Today, the king of falafel is attending catering school. But things have not been going too well. I burned it. Missed it. He is the first street vendor to enroll here, and head chef Chris Burgos is impressed. He, he has the attitude, he has the passion for this business. His food is wonderful, I've tasted it before. So him doing this is basically gonna, gonna give him a little more, you know, um, credence in the business. Future Iron Chef. <laughs> Faraz wants to perfect and expand his culinary skills. Two more weeks out of this school, I'm gonna be out. I'm gonna miss every single day out. From here, you know, the sky's the limit. The sky's the limit.
It's Faris's day off. But he still wants to cook. This afternoon, he's making a traditional upside-down dish for his business partner and staff. Once in a while, I like to go back into the little traditional dishes just to remind us who we are and where we're from. For the same reasons, his wife and three children have now left New York to live back in Ramallah in the West Bank. It was very hard. It was very tough for them to just get into it, but it takes a while. You need kids. When my daughter was eight years old, that's when she went back, and my son was two years. So you adopt faster. You get more space. Uh, it's not like you're 18 and take all that away from them and take them back. Faris is very much a 21st century food vendor. We're looking at the website of the King Falafel. After hours of stewing, it's time to eat. That's why we call it the upside down dish. Remember how we put, layer all the meat in the bottom and all that, the vegetables, and we turn it upside down, so that's why they call it the makluba. Over here, that's my partner, Hassan. He came to the U.S., I think, in 89, he came in. Uh -huh. 89, he came into this country. Back home, he was uh, working in Jerusalem as a chef in a hotel. Him, that's his brother, my partner brother. Just been here in this country for two and a half years. Left five kids with, uh, behind with him and his wife. Things are tough out there. <laughs> and that big chubby guy came in after he got married. He came over here to work, of course, like everybody else did, yes. for a better life. Well, what would New York be like without all of these food vendors, do you think? Well, I don't think it would be very colorful at all. It wouldn't be New York. The carts serve a really serious, important, and noble function in New York in feeding hardworking people. Despite the hassle, most people can't imagine doing anything else. Many aren't making a fortune, but they love what they do. They love being out on the street, meeting people. They love being their own boss. But most of all, they love being a part of the American dream. Because this is New York. And if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere.